And communion is something that we repeat over and over again. Have you ever cogitated on that? Well, I want to answer that question this morning. When a person is born again, when a person comes into a living relationship with Jesus Christ, how many times does that occur? Only once. So baptism is symbolic of our union with Christ. The Lord's table is symbolic of our communion with Christ. And that is an ongoing experience. And this was illustrated even as early as yesterday morning during our men's study. Uh, An individual referenced their love of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the saints of Ephesus, especially chapter 1, because that's the chapter that elevates our standing in Christ. We're seated in the heavenlies in Christ. We've been adopted into his forever family, God's household. We have this, this union with him that is unbreakable and permanent. And it opens up the door for all kinds of communion. And Ephesians has not just one or three chapters. It has six chapters. And like Paul does in just about every one of his epistles, he begins with our position in Christ, and then he moves to our practice as Christians. What we have that enables us to be what he's called us to be. And so the second half of Ephesians is all about our responsibilities, our duties, if you will, what it means to behave as a Christian, to live out what you believe based on your union with Christ. And so baptism is only one time because it speaks of our union with him. But the Lord's table, that's an ongoing until he calls us home where it just continues, speaks of our communion with him. And so this morning, as we break bread, and we're going to be distributing the elements, but we also have the individually sealed cups for anyone that's not comfortable taking from the same dish, if that, and that's okay if you want to grab one of those. But this morning, uh, before we partake, we're going to uh, sing a song, uh, Nothing But the Blood. It's going to be on the overhead. But even before that, I want to share something with you that speaks about the fact that this matters. This matters a whole lot. It matters why we do this. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread. He gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. It is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. It matters how we do this. Let each of us look at our lives. Let us recognize our sin. Let us see the grace of God in the body and blood of Christ, broken for us, poured out for our forgiveness. It matters that we do this. Let us eat the bread, drink from the cup, remember the Lord's death in our place on the cross, looking for his return. Amen.
Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for each who are here today. We thank you for safe journeys. Uh, we think of the McCormicks and the Peppins and others who are traveling. Uh, the Jordans will be heading out and the boys are away. And, and we just thank you that when we pray for one another, we're thinking of each other when we're in the air and on the roadway and, and even coming to church on a Sunday morning. You never know. But thank you for being a God who cares. Thank you for being a God who's here. And for God who has given us this book that he intends for us to open and read and, and study and learn from and meditate in and be reminded of who he is and how he is. And Lord, I just pray today as we consider some scriptures, as we consider what you have for us, that our hearts would be open and fertile and receptive uh, to what you have for us today. Dear Holy Spirit, help me in this service. It's a different group of people. There might be something you want me to add or detract and so I wait on you to direct my steps as I share this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago, when we began to explore what the Bible teaches about death, I shared a quote with you from J.I. Packard. Health and life, I would say in the full and final sense of those words, are not what we die out of, but what we die into. And by his statement, we are encouraged once again to commit our soul and spirit into God's safekeeping. Or as Paul yearned to ultimately be absent from this body and present where? With the Lord. In the final analysis, death is merely a ladder between earth and heaven. It's a link between what is temporal 
and that which is eternal. And though attitudes towards death vary, there are certain scriptural aspects universal to mankind in their application. We considered five last Sunday. And that was in an attempt to build a a proper theology or an eternal perspective on death and dying. Attitude number one or aspect number one, fact number one, everyone what? dies. There's no escaping that. Everyone dies. Number two, no one dies outside of God's purview. He's quite aware of what's going on. Number three, on earth death is final. In heaven, death is a doorway. A doorway. Fact number four, death is uncertain. We've already emphasized you. We do not know what a day may bring forth. Even as we journey to church, how many of you are guaranteed to get through tomorrow, to this afternoon? We just do not know. Death is uncertain. And lastly, number five, death occurs when our soul slash spirit departs. That is the biblical definition of death. It's appointed, reserved for men to die once, and after this, a judgment. In God's eyes, that happens when our soul or spirit departs. But what awaits after that journey is worth the journey. Very much so. St. Augustine reminds us of this in his classic, The City of God. Here's what he writes. Of this I am certain, that no one has ever died who was not destined to die sometime. And of what consequence is it, what kind of death puts an end to life, since he who has died once is not forced to go through the same ordeal a second time? Isn't that great? I think he's got it. They then, who are destined to die, need not be careful to inquire what death they are to die, but into what place death will usher them. That is the primary concern. And could this be Solomon's point in Ecclesiastes chapter 7? It is better to go where? To a house of mourning sorry, then to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. The living should do a sila moment, pause, and consider it. In their newest book, Divine Disruption, loaned to me by an alert parishioner, Tony Evans, pastor, and his four adult children addressed the heartbreaking loss of eight loved ones in less than two years. You lose one person in a year, that's enough, but eight in two. Commenting on Solomon's words, Tony writes, it's better to go to a funeral than a party because only at a funeral do we take life seriously. In good times, no one thinks about the end, but at a funeral, we face the important things in life, family, love, the legacy, we're going to leave behind. In Psalm 90, King David recorded a prayer of Moses. So teach us to number our days that we may get or gain a heart of wisdom. No one numbers their days at a wedding party, Tony notes. They're having too much fun. But at a funeral home, different ball of wax, isn't it? How many of you can remember the first time Death's reality confronted you. Most of us can. It may have been a pet, a friend, a family member, a classmate, or even a cousin, as it was for me. Dee Dee Porman, my uncle's daughter, was four years my senior. She lived in Oregon, where we often traveled to celebrate Christmas. She had cystic fibrosis and spent countless hours under a moist oxygen tent. I can still see the droplets on the sides of it inside. It didn't bother me because we shared many adventures. We had a lot of fun, like collecting worms and storing them in a freezer jar. My aunt wasn't very pleased when she discovered our icy treat about a month after we had left. Then one rainy Christmas after arriving at their home, Dee Dee was no longer there. I think my grandmother told me she had to go away. 
My parents may have talked about it, but I don't remember. I was too young. What I do recall, however, was the unexpected death of my pastor during my freshman year of Bible college in New Brunswick, Canada. School had been in session for about three months when I received a call from California from my parents informing me that he had been struck and killed by a jeep while crossing the road from the church to the parsonage. In spite of the miles that separated us, I broke down and I just began to sob. Why? Because this man had reached out to me as a teen. He had been influencing my life and I hurt deeply because it severed our earthly relationship. What was I experiencing in that moment? What was I experiencing? G word, grief. Overwhelming emotional or mental suffering caused by bereavement. The Bible's description is succinct. There is a time to weep and a time or season to mourn. I know we rejoice in the assurance of heaven. We, we look forward to that. But it's the here and now we struggle with, especially when death snatches a loved one. I didn't say God. Death is a final enemy that takes these individuals. So against the backdrop of that future home in heaven, secured through the glorious resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Shepherd of our souls, this is the part where you smile because that's what's coming. Against that backdrop, I want to pull back the curtain on grief, beginning with C.S. Lewis. In his book, A Grief Observed, he bears his soul over the death of his wife. In doing so, he verbalizes, he puts in print what we might not otherwise be comfortable discussing because as he writes, as he speaks, it's through the voice of grief. One lady, after completing his work, remarked, it helped me to understand that each experience of grief is unique. And why is that? Well, look around, we're all different. We're all unique individuals, and when we grieve, that's ours. This uniqueness is captured in the words of Linda Frederick. She's a woman who lost seven babies to miscarriage. One's enough, but seven? When a baby dies after having been born, and seen, touched, and known, there's a totally different attitude by family and friends, and even the medical profession. If a child dies after having lived for some years, people cry with you. They, they hold you and comfort you. If a teen dies, there are friends who share your pain and give you strength and courage. But when a baby dies who has not yet been born and known, you are all alone. No one demonstrates to you that the baby was important and worthwhile. There is a definite lack of cards, phone calls, hugs, and softly murmured, I'm sorry's. With glaring honesty, she continues, Silently, I grieved for my unknown baby, as I had for six others. Silently, I endured the well-meant but torturous words of others who assured me it was best the baby had died early, that it was probably deformed or handicapped. Silently, I began to hate them for their insensitivity, and silently, I began to really resent God. Ever been there? You're not alone. As Anthony Evans admitted after his 38-year-old first cousin, 38, and mother of four girls, died suddenly. When he verbalized his anger to his dad, Tony told him, it's okay to be angry as long as we don't allow our anger to cause us to sin or to turn our heart against God. I think Anthony's confession bears repeating, owning my anger was the beginning of understanding that Jesus is still with me even in my grief. We don't have to get everything resolved before we come to God. You mean to tell me I can go to God angry? I don't have to have it all figured out before He'll hear me and accept my expressions of grief? That's exactly what I'm telling you. I have it on good authority. The Evans clan. 
In Romans 12, Paul calls the church to rejoice with those who rejoice and what? Weep with those who weep. But as we cry with those who mourn, we need to recognize something, that every season of weeping is unique to the individual shedding the tears at that moment. That's theirs. And even though grief is a, a, a difficult cry to pin down, it's hard to grasp. We must acknowledge that God accepts our expressions of sorrow. Why do I say this? Because it's important to remember when talking about the process of grief or the various levels of grief that most folk experience when they face death. C.S. Lewis described it as a winding valley that can bring about new things at every turn. Isn't that a beautiful description of grief? Winding valley, new things at every turn. This means we may or may not greet every turn in exactly the same way. You might actually skip some of the turns. But knowing the different stages, the different levels, the, the process, I think that will help us when we're called upon to walk through the valley of the shadow of grief. So with that in mind, here's what most people encounter when they navigate grief's valley. Turn number one, shock, shock. Emotional numbness. This isn't happening to me. I can't believe they're gone. You're kidding, right? One has only to recall two rather defeated, discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus who failed to recognize their resurrected Lord. How do you not see that that's Jesus? Was their perception dulled by the shock of his demise? We had thought that this was going to happen, and now he's buried, he's dead. I think it played a part. Shock. Turn number two, strong reaction, such as weeping or wailing. I'll never forget, after making a notification, a woman calling her sister, and when she told her sister that mom was gone, mom was dead, she had died, the wail that I heard on the other end of the phone. It came from some place deep that only comes at a moment like that, and I still hear it. The Bible reveals Jesus weeping at the grave of Lazarus. In Acts 8, we read of devout men carrying the body of Stephen to his burial where they made great lamentation. And it literally means in the Greek, loud chest-beating lamentation for him. It was no different for Abraham when he came to mourn for Sarah. My, how he loved Sarah. Why wouldn't he? She called him Lord. I don't recommend any wives going home today and, or husbands and telling their wives to call them Lord. It probably won't be received in exactly the same way. But anyway, he mourned for Sarah and he went to weep for her. And the Hebrew means to cry freely and profusely from sadness following her death. Strong reaction. Turn number three, depression. Often accompanied by a smothering cloak of loneliness. You find yourself saying and doing things you don't usually say or do. And keep in mind that every one of these turns that I'm sharing is a normal human reaction to an abnormal event of which death, in my opinion, qualifies. Normal reaction to an abnormal event. Turn number four, fear. You feel like you're falling apart. You're, you're panicky. You're wondering, how am I going to survive in my loved one's absence? Again, it's common to feel that way. Turn number five, guilt. This is especially prevalent following a suicide when family and friends begin to blame themselves. If only I had... If only we were. Standard responses to suicide's trauma. Standard responses. By the way, suicide's its own complicated thing. And the grief is complicated because suicide is complicated. Guilt. Turn number six, anger. Anger. Often a sour... So, let me back up. 
often a sorrowing person, will blame others. They'll blame the loved one that died. How come you left so early? Suicide, what were you thinking? Was I not worth it? They'll, they'll, they'll even blame God. You know, Job decided to do that before death came. I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain. I will say to God, yeah, you are listening, God. Don't simply condemn me. Let me, tell me the charge you're bringing against me. I sense Job is upset. Do you get that same opinion? Our church sign, if you haven't noticed, reminds us that it's good to be strong. It's, 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 it's uh, oh, I'm losing my words today. You had to give me quarantine earlier, and I, now I can't come with this one. But it's okay to be human. You know, we validate human courage and the things that have been, the mountains that have been surmounted by, by human will and that type of thing. And it's good to be strong, but it's okay to be human. Anger. Turn number seven introduces us to apathy. No one understands how I feel. Life's not worth living. Withdrawing, retreating into our shell, wanting to be left alone is, is a typical at this level, at this turn. But it's troublesome if it continues for months on end. That's a danger sign when that happens. And the danger with either apathy or even anger is getting hung up on it, is being, being snagged by either one. And again, it isn't wrong to feel these emotions. They're not wrong. But the goal is to avoid getting stuck. I don't want to get stuck there. One way to evade this pitfall is by heeding the advice of Maury Schwartz. Isn't that a great name? Aren't you glad you weren't born with that name? Maury Schwartz, an elderly retired college professor who in the last months of his life shared these weekly visits with one of his previous students, a writer named Mitch Album. In Mitch's book that ultimately came out of this, Tuesdays with Maury, have you ever heard of it? He shares one of his prof's coping mechanisms for dealing with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, the brutal illness that was attacking his neurological uh, system in his body. How come I can get neurological out, but the other words just evade me? Here's what Maury says. Sometimes in the mornings, that's when I mourn. I mourn what I've lost, referring to his mobility, because it shuts everything down. I mourn the slow, insidious way in which I am dying. But then I stop mourning. I give myself a good cry if I need it. But then I concentrate on all the good things still in my life. And you know what one of them was? I have all the time in the world to say goodbye to folk. What am I going to do? I can't go anywhere. So they're coming to me. And we're sitting there for hours on end chatting. And I'm saying goodbye. Incredible. I don't allow myself any more self-pity than that. A little each morning, a few tears, and that's it. Mitch's conclusion is insightful. I thought about all the people I knew who spent many of their waking hours feeling sorry for themselves. How useful it would be to put a daily limit on self-pity. Just a few tearful minutes, then on with the day. Isn't that great? So the next time you're having a pity party, and I used to have these a lot early in my marriage, and Ellen was great. She was the one that cured me of it. She would know when I was going into my little, and she'd go, listen, Gary, you go in the other room, you have a good cry. And when you're ready to come back and be a man, you come out. What would that do? Did I ever go to the room? I never did, because it would crack me up. Get a little timer, something, and just turn that on. And once it goes, ding, all right, now I got a job to do. This brings us to turn number eight. Adjustment. Adjustment. Slowly the grieving person learns to accept their loss, come to a place of acceptance, to, to rearrange his or her life as they come to grips with the new reality. It's not about forgetting your loved one, your friend. It's not about forgetting your unborn child. 
It's about getting back to even, of, of re-engaging with life, of being able to function again. Is this level or stage of grief reached overnight? Is there a pill down at Walmart in the pharmacy you can take? Grief ending. <laughs> no. It takes time to heal a broken heart. Have you heard that phrase? There's only one thing wrong with it. Time alone never heals anything. Why is that? Because time is neutral. It's what you do with your time that makes all the difference in the world. So no matter where a person finds himself in grief's winding valley, our goal is not to shelter them from their bereavement. Our goal is not to assist them in escaping it. Instead, we need to encourage them to draw upon God's divine resources. The eternal God is your refuge or dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. These everlasting arms, who are they connected to? They're connected to the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in how many of our tribulations? All of them. All of them. I read once that grief has its time. While grief is fresh, every attempt to divert only irritates. You must wait till grief be digested. Self-medicating through drugs or alcohol isn't a healthy solution. That's not a good alternative. Making major life changes won't erase the sorrow you feel. Stuffing it won't eliminate it. You ever tried to take the big beach ball and hold it under the water? How successful were you? Eventually it, boom, it bursts through the surface. Usually when the person next to you least expects it, if you're doing it properly so you can get them, boom. And, oh. But that's what grief does when you try to suppress it. It comes out usually when you don't want it to. But admitting it's okay not to be okay, I think that's a step in the right direction. Allowing it to work its way through your system is beneficial, along with sliding closer to God at every turn. Now, it's already two minutes past 12, but I'm still going. I'm going to let Tony bring us home. In this book, he writes about his sweetheart and wife of, I don't know how many years, Lois. She comes down with a reoccurrence of her cancer. It's terminal. There's nothing that can be done. And he writes in this section about what he did to court her and win her heart. And he said, one night I called Lois and asked her to go with me to the Gwyn Oak Amusement Park. Nights are cold in Baltimore and when the wind churned up off Gwyn Falls, well, it might cause a young couple to huddle tight. The park had hot chocolate, cotton candy, and thrill rides, like the Big Dipper. I have nightmares about that one. I've got bad experiences with the Big Dipper. And the whip. My favorite was a roller coaster called the Wild Mouse. So what do you think he did first with Lois? He went to the Wild Mouse. Two tickets, please. Because that had dips and turns. There was one part where it shoots straight down and banks so hard into this turn, you feel like the car is going to come right off the tracks. So on the first tall drop, Lois screamed and grabbed on tightly to my arm. Yes, Lord, I agreed. The wilder that mouse got, the closer Lois slid to me. And when we hit that hairpin curve, she pressed into me, head on my shoulder. Hallelujah, I declared. Now picture Tony doing this. It would be a lot better. By the time we circled back to the station, you couldn't have slid a butter knife between us. And the rest, as they say, is history. I've been thinking about that wild mouse roller coaster ride a lot lately in this season of hard dips and unexpected turns. You see, the, the sudden movement and unexpected turns of that roller coaster made Lois slide closer to me. And life is often exactly like that. 
Sometimes God allows discomfort and distress because he wants us to move close to him. We don't cling to God nearly as much in carefree times when we're at the party, when things are smooth. We run to God when things are frightening or tough. Grief is a slippery slope, but it can be traversed with the help of family and friends. Rather than fearing grief's voice, here's the challenge I want to leave you today. Embrace it. Don't run from it. Don't try to bury it. Embrace it. In the knowledge that God understands, He's present, promises never to leave us nor forsake us. And in the end, the promise is, heaven awaits. Father, we're a blessed people. We have a foundation, the promise of heaven. And because your son is now seated at your right hand, when you give him the nod and say, call your church home, it's going to happen. And we're going to be absent from this body and present with you, given our new glorified body. We thank you, God, for this hope that awaits. But in the meantime, in the here and now, we are called upon to navigate the winding valley of grief, which includes numerous turns. And so I pray, if we're in that right now, if when it comes down the pike, and it will, that in those moments, at those turns, we will not turn away, but we will slide closer to you and see your smile as you comfort us and help us to cross to the other side. Thank you, Father, for giving us a theology, an eternal perspective. Help us to not forget that when everything hits the fan. We love you. We thank you for loving us. We bless your holy name. And God's people said, amen. amen.